where I'm going in the long run is a, exactly about this connection between the professional and moral, and has to do in the long run with what I think is a narrative, not just for teachers' unions, but for our field as a whole. So I'd encourage you to think about what I'm going to say about education generally in that context. And then as I conclude my remarks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little bit of a sense of um, my diagnosis in terms of where we are in public education in America right now, uh, a hint in terms of the prescription for where I think things need to go in the future, and then a sense of the implications uh, for uh, progressive teacher unionism and for the field as a whole. But I really commend you, I commend TURN for its persistence in this work and for bringing to the table um, you know, both management and union to grapple with these tough issues facing our field. I think one of the problems that we have that we see in the election that we just went through is this kind of bipolarization of everything. You're either all here or all there, and we're famous for that in education. We're you know, all bilingual or we're all, uh, I mean, we're all total, uh, e English is a second language, total immersion or transitional bilingual. We're whole language, we're phonics, we're charter schools or we're not charter schools. And uh, most of the issues wind up in some gray area in between as a result of some of our own internecine warfare. We then wind up having reforms imposed on us rather than our voice being the lead voice in shaping reform in our field. And we have to change that. I think that is part of the route uh, to success and route to the future in public education uh, is that the field has a stronger voice in shaping policy. But how do you get there? And I think you get there along the lines uh, that Pat was just suggesting. So let me trace a little bit of my uh, own narrative here. I served uh, in a variety of capacities. I've been a teacher. I've been a principal uh, in my career. I've been an organizer of various kinds, a community organizer. I was in VISTA at the beginning of my career. Uh, I've formed local groups in support of public education that bring together the business community, university, philanthropic community, teachers, teachers unions. I've done a lot of labor management work. Uh, I've served on our State Board of Education in Massachusetts under two different governors, one Republican and one Democratic. Um, and, uh, and I've been on the faculty at Harvard for some time founded a number of nonprofit organizations. I'm saying this all to give you a sense of the perspective. My career is sort of situated at the juncture of policy, research, and practice. And that's the perspective from which I come. I spent five years, about a year and a half ago, I stepped down as Secretary of Education in Massachusetts. I had been Chairman of the State Board of Education. Then Deval Patrick appointed me as Secretary in a new integrated secretariat that covered pre-K through higher education. Um, and though most of my career has been focused on K-12, I then had responsibility for the entire span. We have done a lot of work uh, in K-12 education in Massachusetts. I was involved in our first set of reforms in 1993 and shaping uh, what was really the seminal education uh, reform law in our state that led to our going from the middle of the pack in terms of student achievement to number one in the nation in terms of student achievement by virtually any indicator you want to look at, we are at or near the top. Uh, even when measured internationally, Massachusetts students, if you're measured as a separate jurisdiction, have done extraordinarily well, either at or near the top on TIMS and uh, uh, doing better than most of the rest of this country on PISA and in top categories, depending on how you break down those scores. We have low dropout rates, we have high participation rates, in terms of college going and all the college testing and things of that nature. We have a lot of which to be proud. And we worked hard on that in the uh, Deval Patrick administration in Massachusetts. And we kept our first place standing. We uh, have, for the past four administrations of the NAEP test, maybe five now, been first in the nation on math and English at fourth and eighth grade. Uh, and no other state has done it once. We've now done it four times in a row. So we're really proud of what we've accomplished, and yet uh, I always said as secretary, it's, 
yeah, the celebration should be short. Um, doing well is not good enough. Behind these averages on which these rankings are computed are deep, persistent achievement gaps. And those gaps tell us that we have not achieved the goal. However well we've done in Massachusetts, we have not, set, we, we have not achieved the goal that we set out to achieve when we began our journey toward excellence and equity in the early 1990s. And that goal was unabashedly, boldly, all means all. We were going to educate all of our students to a level of proficiency that would enable them to be successful in life. And when we said all, we meant all. And what we meant by success wasn't a narrow definition of how well you did on particular tests, although, to be sure, standards and measurement and accountability was part of our reform scheme in Massachusetts and something that we're proud of and have the scars from. Uh, but it turns out that that strategy of reform, while important, while necessary, was insufficient to achieving the goal of all means all. And again, I was going to give the definition of success here, just so we're clear. It wasn't a narrow definition of success. It include, included preparing young people to be able to get and hold a 21st century high skill, high knowledge job that would enable them to support themselves and a family if they so chose. It was a, the kind of an education that would enable them to have uh, the kind of civic awareness that they could be an informed citizen and an active leader should they choose to be one, to enable them to be the head of a family with all the values and characteristics we associate with that, and finally to be lifelong learners, to be able to solve problems that we as educators can't even conceive of today. So that was the definition of success that was animating our work. And we started with a bold Education Reform Act in which we subscribed to standards, assessments, accountability. We had high standards as well as high stakes in Massachusetts. Uh, so most states didn't do it that way. We did. We had, uh, we, some states had high standards and low stakes or low standards and high stakes. We did both. It made a difference. It made that set of reform stronger. We also did something a lot of other states didn't do in Massachusetts was we invested in building the capacity to achieve the new goals in education. We doubled state spending in Massachusetts in real dollars between 1993 and 2000. And we also were successful in maintaining a bipartisan nonpartisan commitment to the goal of reform, to the all means all goal, as expressed in having uniform high standards in math and in English and ultimately in science uh, for all of our students. So there was widespread commitment from the field, from the business community, from the media, from the philanthropic community, from Republican governors, from Democratic governors, and from the legislatures. There was a willingness to commit to this and an ongoing kind of persistence. We kept at it for a long period of time. But still and all, with all those advantages and uh, with, the, uh, you know, the, with, the, with the performance of which we were proud, 20 years after those reforms in 1993, here we are uh, in, in 2014, and we have some of the deepest, widest achievement gaps in the nation between our top performing students and our lower performing students. <clears throat> so I think we should do, as policymakers, what we're always asking teachers to do is look at the data and then reconsider your performance, reconsider your strategy. Now, when I look at the data, I see, for example, a persistent iron law correlation between socioeconomic status and educational achievement and attainment. We can't really avoid seeing that if we look at the large bulk of data. And it exists in all of our respective jurisdictions, and it exists in most places around the world, but especially here in the US, especially in this time of rising inequality, more than ever before, your socioeconomic status is destiny. We talk a lot at the School of Education about, <clears throat> you know, really demographics shouldn't be destiny. 
and demographics aren't destiny for any individual. We all know of great successes, individuals who've defied the odds, and I'm sure there are plenty in this room who have defied the odds to go on to be successful in spite of um, what the demographic status of the individual might predict. But we can't avoid looking at those macro numbers, even if we're reluctant to have that conversation. And when I look at those numbers, I begin to ask the question, not so much is what we've done over the past 20 years the right thing to have done, but is it sufficient? And as we step back, is what we're asking schools to do actually doable within the framework that currently defines schooling in our country? And that's where I get to the metaphor of an engine. We have a public education system, which is really our human capital development system. It's, a, it's an education system, yes. It's also a daycare system. We don't talk much about that, but it has an important function for our families and our communities in performing that daycare function. And sometimes, as we think about reform, we don't think enough about how meaningful it is in that way. But so we have a system with multiple functions. It's an education system. It's a human resource development system. It's a daycare system. It performs all these functions for our society. And <clears throat> we have basically accepted in the 21st century a model that was set up to do the work of society as that work was conceived in the early 20th century. We built an engine there to drive our human resource system that was built to meet the needs of that time, which is now you know, a century and a quarter ago. And what we needed at that time was we had big cities that were developing, seeing lots of immigration. We had a new industrial economy that was burgeoning. We needed a lot of workers quickly to do low skill, low knowledge, routine kinds of jobs. So we took that factory model, which was very popular at the time, Taylorism and all, and we said, let's adapt that to doing mass education. Let's take Horace Mann's concept, which I think was a great concept in its time. He was, he was the first secretary of education um, in Massachusetts and in the country and had this wonderful idea of the common school. We'd have a common school that would educate everybody. And that would create what he called the great balance wheel of society. So we take that notion of a common school and we would apply it across the board and we would batch process mass produce education and turn people over very quickly to this new and growing economy. That engine we built at that time was a good engine to do the work that needed to be done. It had all kinds of byproducts and results that weren't uh, you know, overall terrific if we looked at them through a 20th, 21st century lens. The graduation rate at the turn of the century or in the early uh, decades of the 20th century was less than 10%. But then all we really needed was a bell curve distribution of student achievement over a very low center. And that's what that system gave us. That's what that engine gave us. And education reform from that time forward was conceived as simply making improvements, tinkering with that basic engine. We, by the time we got to the late 20th century, we were strapping that engine with standards and accountability. We were glomming on a component of choice. Earlier in the century, we'd added kindergartens. Uh, we had added middle schools. We'd added a number of different reform features. To be sure, we had improved performance. Now, instead of 10% graduating, uh, sometimes it got as high as 70, 75% of people uh, were graduating. What they were graduating with and how it related to the 10% who are graduating at the beginning of the century was something that you could have arguments about. But it, it did improve its performance in some ways. But we did ask it to do, by the time we got to the end of the 20th century, and this is really at the heart of what I want to talk about later, so it's important here. Asking the system, as we as policymakers did at that time, to do the job of all means all, 
is a radically different ambition than to do the job of the bell curve over a low center. To get everyone to the point where they are ready for success in the 21st century is an audaciously ambitious goal to set for ourselves in education. And it was easier for policymakers to do that as a matter of policy because they didn't really have to think about how you built the inherent capacity to get that done. And my contention is what we as a policy community asked you as the field to do was so radically different from the work that you were doing that it really required not tinkering toward utopia, as David Tyak and colleagues had argued in his book, but a whole new engine, a whole new way of thinking about the task of education and child development that would align better and be robust enough to reach this kind of 21st century expectation of all means all. Why did I think that? When I look at the existing engine, I see a number of shortcomings. And let me talk about several of those because they will point the way toward the prescription or toward the design work that I think needs to happen if we're to build a 21st century engine of education reform. So one problem is we don't have enough time in education to do all the things that we're being asked to do now. I don't have to tell you that. This is where you live day to day. Every time we as society have a problem, we want to push that on schools and ask schools to solve it, even if it has nothing to do with the original mission of schools. It could be nutrition, it could be violence reduction, it could be sex education, it could be driver education. All these things we want schools to do. And we push them over to schools, particularly as families and communities uh, by virtue of the economy, are able to do less and less. Schools are expected to do more and more. Yet the basic structure, staffing, organization, and amount of time and resources committed to education hasn't fundamentally changed. While we're pushing all these ancillary functions in, we are also asking schools to perform at world-class standards in core subjects. So we're asking you to do better with students and to educate all of them to a higher level than ever before. We basically said, get all students to a level of performance that, have here to, that has heretofore been reserved for the elite few. Most educators, had they known how to do that, would have been doing it already without being told to do it. But that's what we set as our formal goal of all means all. So we asked them to do that, and oh, while you're at it, meet some of these challenges that children bring in with them from backgrounds of poverty or from speaking different languages or a growing number of students with severe disabilities who come into the school. And while you're at it, give them a, um, you know, a, a portfolio of 21st century skills. There are subjects other than the ones we measure in that are important that we need them to be skillful at, using technology, thinking creatively, working collaboratively, communicating clearly, speaking another language, being more aware of the world around them, on and on the list of 21st century skills goes. And do that all in the same amount of time that you've always had, to just do the three R's. Well, it turns out it doesn't fit in the box. You know, every time a new sort of research finding comes up, somebody says, well, it's really important to have physical education. I was visiting a school the other day that really took physical education and recess and uh, all, the, all the time and energy that students put into oxygenating their brains quite seriously and made time in the school day for this. And, you know, I was asked later by media, you know, why don't we do this with all schools? Don't you think this is a good idea? And I said, well, of course it's a good idea, but the reason we don't do it with all schools is we haven't made the time to do it. So we have all these artificial competitions within the box of time that we've been given. Is social studies more important than science? Is physical education more important than math? Is health more important than English? There isn't enough room, so it sets off this artificial competition and this narrowing of the curriculum. 
I mean, we have to face up to it as policymakers by prioritizing and privileging certain subjects for which I don't apologize. I think these are the most important subjects in terms of a baseline to enter the conversation in 21st century middle class life in this country of English, math, and science. But by privileging those, by measuring um, from an accountability standpoint performance against those, inevitably it was going to create incentives to overemphasize those subjects at the expense of other subjects if you weren't going to expand time. If you really look at the theory behind standards-based reform, it was supposed to be a mastery learning system where instead of time being the constant and learning varying, you either get it or you don't, which is what we currently do. And if you don't, we have two equally unattractive alternatives for you. We've got research to prove either course is ill-advised. We'll either retain you in grade or we'll socially promote you. That's what happens if you have time the constant and let learning vary. But if you flip it around, as standards-based reform was, was uh, supposed to do, you have learning, at least at a high minimum level, become the constant, become the standard, and time will vary to meet the needs of the learner. It's no longer about seat time. It should be about mastery. But we didn't change the structure of education to allow for each child to get the quantity and quality of instruction they needed to achieve the goal. Why? In my view, fundamentally, because that was inconvenient for adults to do it. It would have led to a very highly differentiated kind of schedule uh, that wouldn't work well in the lives of most adults, so we didn't do it. And I'm going to come back to that uh, in a minute. So one of the limitations of our current system is we haven't allowed enough time. A second limitation, and there are many, but a second limitation is um, it's an undifferentiated approach, right? It takes each child and brings them into the system. This is what I think of as the Horace Mann fallacy, if you will. No disrespect to Horace Mann, but the idea of the common school was a radically important idea, but the notion that one treatment, irrespective of the background that you bring in, is going to work the same for everybody, and just through its magical power, the common school is going to create this level playing field um, by utilizing actually only 20% of a child's waking hours between kindergarten and grade 12 are spent inside school. 80% waking hours outside, 20% in. That that, on average, was going to work to create the great balance wheel in our society to create an equality of opportunity is just shown by the data to be patently untrue. It hasn't worked. And I used to say it as Secretary of Education, schools alone as currently constituted are insufficient to achieve the goal of all means all. There just isn't enough time in there to do the job and we haven't parceled time out to meet the needs of different children in different ways, the ways in which they need to be met. I teach a course on education policy at Harvard, and one of the ways I begin the course is to show a picture of one of my children when they were at kindergarten age, and then <clears throat> talk about how proud I am with it, that child and where she's gone and what she's done, but then take a look at all the advantages that she's had by virtue of having a privileged background and privileged kinds of opportunities to do things. Everything from prenatal care on forward uh, to, uh, you know, to reading in the home, to medical, constant medical care, to early education, you know, to after school learning opportunities, to summer camps, to uh, travel, to all kinds of uh, experiences, stability and housing, so on and so forth. And then, and my daughters, my children all went to an urban school system, side by side, sitting with children who have deficits, not personally, not in terms of their capacity, but in all those categories of support that my daughter has had, they have not had. And then we're asking you as educators in schools, on 20% of their waking hours, to equalize that. And on average, the data suggests you can't do that. Not because you're incompetent, but because the job itself is too large. 
Why is it in Massachusetts that when we select 40 schools in a particular year that are chronically underperforming, that all of them have extremely high concentrations of low-income youngsters? Is it because incompetence in the education system has somehow mysteriously aggregated around this set of schools? Or is there something in the nature of poverty that schools, on average, are not strong enough to overcome? I obviously think it's the latter. So we need a system of education that meets every child where he or she is in early childhood and gives them the education they need in order them, for them to be successful at each stage along the educational trajectory and to emerge with some level of post-secondary education ready for the kind of success that I described earlier. That we can't do it magically. We have to recognize that if education and if standard setting means we're going to set a common finish line, at least at a minimum standard, and we have children who come into kindergarten, as I did in Massachusetts, I'd, come in, I'd see children coming into kindergarten with one-third the vocabulary of the children that they were sitting next to. And yet we were going to give those children the same treatment. When we know from the research that kids coming into kindergarten divide into roughly five quintiles with about a five-year separation from kids who are two years behind on literacy, two to three years behind, to kids who are two to three years ahead. And for the most part, the research will tell us they'll stay in those quintiles throughout their trajectory through K-12 education. In a certain sense, it's over before it even begins. And we know that. And yet we haven't done anything to differentiate the approach. So it's like we have this 100-yard dash and we know some kids are starting 300 yards behind the finish line, and others are starting about 50 yards from the finish line. We fire the starting gun at the beginning of kindergarten. We wait 13 years, and when they don't finish at the same place at the same time, we act surprised. Well, why would they? Why would they? Because we haven't treated them any differently along the race course. It's the same thing. Another analogy I use is like a hospital. What we're doing in education, were we to do it in medical care, would be the equivalent of opening a hospital and saying to everybody who walks in the front door, irrespective of your ailment, <clears throat> we're going to give you the same treatment and the same length of stay because it's convenient for us to offer it in this way. It wouldn't work in terms and wouldn't be tolerated in terms of public health, but that's what we're doing in education, and it isn't working very well for us at this point. So we've got to think of a new engine. We've got to think of a new way. If we're serious about this goal of all means all, and my contention is that part of the narrative that Louise was talking about earlier, and I think she's right, I think we need a new narrative, is that if it's our job to get to all means all, we need certain tools and strategies that go beyond historically what we've had in order to get to, the, to that level. And so we need a new engine. And we need to be a clear voice as the field in terms of what that engine should look like. We have this felicitous coincidence in this moment right now between what we ought to do, what moral leaders, what civic leaders, what religious leaders have told us forever that we ought to do is we ought to give each generation every possible opportunity to realize its full potential. We owe that to our children. And by our children, I mean not just our family's children, but all the children. So moralists have said that to us for a long time, but we've managed to find ways to ignore that exhortation. Now it becomes in our economic self-interest. This is what spurred the kinds of reforms that are pejoratively labeled corporate reforms. And I don't, I don't fully buy that labeling, but we can come back to that. But to be sure, business leaders were in the forefront of many of the reforms that started in the 80s and 90s because they realized there was an economic imperative to educate all of our children to a high level. In other words, we weren't going to be able to grow jobs. We weren't going to be able to nurture the prosperity of this economy um, unless everybody was ready to do high-skill, high-knowledge jobs. Because the low-skill, low-knowledge jobs we could already see by the end of the last century 
certainly by the fourth quarter of the last century, those low-skill, low-knowledge, routine jobs were either being automated or going offshore. And we've now experienced that and the consequences of that. So we have this coincidence between these two vectors, what we ought to do and what we need to do, and they come together at a moment when we're having some severe doubts about education reform and about the power of education. We've been on a reform course for a while, and yet results, I mean, if we look at the NAEP, our, our, our rate of improvement has been relatively flat. We aren't getting to all means all. Not all of our children are ready for 21st century employment. But there's a lot of uncertainty about what needs to be done. And certain voices get privileged, get louder than others, and then reforms happen. People, you know, uh, <clears throat> people lust after the silver bullet. Is there a silver bullet here? Is a teacher evaluation? Is this what we need to fix the whole field? And we latch on to some fairly simplistic ideas. And my contention is that isn't what it's about. We're seeing the problem in the wrong terms. We're not seeing the overall picture, which is we've got, on average, two week in intervention to do what we've been asked to do in the field. So I think we need a design process. I think part of our narrative needs to be we need to build a new engine to do the job that policymakers have correctly asked us to do, which is the job of all means all. But if you're going to ask us to do it, it needs to have the design, it needs to have the strategies and the resources and the support that will be necessary to achieve all means all. And that's where we have to put on our design hats and do some design thinking. And I'm trying to start an education redesign lab at Harvard where we do some thinking about this in a, in a in sort of creative and immediate and urgent way to, um, to lend some voice to the field and to our communities to say, here's what it really ought to look like. In this moment of doubt about where we're headed in 21st century, we actually have a vision. We actually have some place toward which we're migrating and we can plan steps to get there. Nobody expects us to adopt a brand new way of educating children overnight. We're very conservative about schools, as you know. Try and change the daily schedule of your school by 20 minutes, or eliminate a day here or there, or a vacation. You'll get the biggest turnout of the school board meeting that you'll ever get all year long for any issue. So we're conservative about it, irrespective of, of partisan political labels. We are conservative within the profession, and outside the profession about change in education. So we're going to move slowly, and I'm not naive about that. But at the same time, we need a new vision if we're going to be successful, if we're going to keep the franchise, if you will, of education. We need a new vision on where we're going. So I have hunches about the new vision. Let me share several of those hunches with you, and then I'll talk for a few minutes about what I think the implications are for the field, and then we can have a, a conversation about it. So three hunches. One, and you can get them if you backward map from what I've just said. One is we need to differentiate. We have lots of names for this. We call it personalization, customization, individualization, you know, mastery-based learning, student-centered learning. We need to meet that child where he or she is and give them what they need in terms of support and academic challenge. And by support, I mean not just academic support, but support inside and outside the school and the quantity of time uh, that they need and, and attention starting in early childhood. We need to differentiate. We need to figure out how to do that. All the things that I'm going to say are e much easier said than done. So let's stipulate that. But we need to have a system that has, like our healthcare system has, the capacity to differentiate between what people need and get them what they need to attain the goal. In the healthcare system, it's health. In our system, it's being educated and being prepared for success. So thinking about what that actually looks like and how we would do that in a way that was practical and feasible and affordable and explainable in our communities, that's the design work in that sphere. The second piece is, we need to mitigate those problems that arise in children's lives outside of school that get in the way of children attending school 
and being attentive and supplying motivated effort when they get to school. Until we create something of a level playing field, the like of which they have in high performing places like Finland, in terms of issues like health and mental health and social services and housing stability and things of that nature, it is impossible to reach our children and make progress with them. If you have a homeless child living in the back seat of a car and you discover that as a teacher on a Monday morning, you know you're not going to make any progress with that child until that situation gets resolved. We need systems that don't require the teacher to solve the problem. Teachers are already overtaxed with everything else they've been asked to do. But we need a system where that teacher can pick up the phone and call somebody who does know about that and can get on it immediately and so that issue is somehow taken care of so that child can come back into class and be ready to learn in the true sense. And we've got a lot of good work going on in this area, but it happens in pockets, it happens in islands, and it's isolated and it doesn't get scaled up. The work in this design area is to figure out how to scale up some of that good work that's already out there and happening. The third area where I think we need to do some heavy design work is in out of school learning. As long as we're defining the, the school day as six, six and a half hours a day, 180 days a year, we know that affluent families are spending eight to 10 times more than poor families are able to spend on the enrichment and learning that happens outside of school. Now, we all know that education isn't confined to school. Kids are learning as long as they're awake. And children who have privilege have the opportunity to be continuously learning, continuously stimulated after school, in the summer. You know, music lessons, all those advantages that I chronicled earlier, all the things that we who have privilege are able to do for our children. And it turns out that those advantages and the flip side, the disadvantages, have every bit as much to do with achievement gaps as anything that happens in school. And there's four times as much time devoted to them. So until we create something like a level playing field in terms of learning, access to technology, for example, outside of school, we are not going to be able in schools in that 20% of time, on average, to close those gaps. So we've got to figure out how to level that playing field. Again, in this domain, it's not so much a question of what we do, because we know, those of us who send our children to summer camps or to after school programs, we know what quality looks like. And to be sure, you'd have to build in quality controls and things of this nature. But it's access is the big issue. Access and affordability. How do we make that available? So my contention is in those several areas, at a minimum, and there are a whole bunch of other design features that need to happen. I'm talking about ones that are sort of exogenous to schools that have to do with the school structure and organization. We have to figure out what a 21st century system looks like so that we can begin to migrate in that direction. We need to have an elevator speech about what a new system looks like so that when we talk to a political candidate running for office, they have a narrative about what it is that needs to happen in our sphere in order not only for us to be successful, but more importantly, for the children to be successful. And right now, our dialogue is really scattered. I get called by political candidates all the time, and they, they, they don't have a larger conception. And that's not their fault. They've got 100 different issues to concentrate on in different fields. It's partly our fault, because we haven't projected a conception to them of what it takes to get the job done. So the alternative for most candidates is, Give me the hottest silver bullet that you have this year. What is it, early childhood education? Is it career readiness? Is it teacher eval? Um, you know, what's the hot ticket, the reform du jour for this year? I'll run on that and let's see what happens because I don't have a larger narrative to put it in. And my argument is it's up to us not to wait for other people to impose reform on us but for us to lead the reform movement by shaping that vision. And I think it's possible to do that. Now, let me talk just briefly in closing about what I think are the implications for labor management relations and education, but for 
teacher unionism generally and for the field generally. We have in the past 20 or 30 years entered a completely different era in, in public education. And cert we've crossed certain bridges that we're not going to go back over. So we have created standards in our field. And in most fields, we have standards and we measure progress. Look at business. Business has targets. They keep track of performance. They hold people accountable for performance. And there are consequences. If you don't hit your performance targets in most businesses, you're going to go out of business. We've accepted that logic in education. It has its strengths and weaknesses and excesses in the way in which we've done it. But pretty much it was a grand bargain that we made with policymakers and the general public. We asked them to invest more money in education. And they say, tell us why this is a good investment. In the past, for many years, we got, a, we got away with saying, just trust us. We're good people trying to do good things for kids. Now they're saying, show me. Show me what it is you're actually achieving with the very substantial investment we're getting. We're not likely to change that. We're not likely to pull back that. We can argue about the details of how the system works or what things are appropriate or is it too much testing or should testing be used for evaluation purposes and so on and so forth. There are blunt instruments in there and not all of them have been applied well. And in many places there are excesses and problems. But the logic of standards-based reform is here to stay. The logic of choice is here, at least at a limited level. <clears throat> Uh, and has been introduced through a variety of reform mechanisms. Americans like choice. We welcome choice. We appreciate choice in virtually every other aspect of our lives. And so Americans like this notion of having some choice in education. And that's not likely to go away. And the competitiveness that that brings in terms of our work is not likely to go away. A third thing is, as Pat referenced, we've got lots of new people coming into our field. New people take for granted a lot of things, a lot of the blood, sweat, and tears that those of you in the union movement have put out to get sort of basic fairness for teachers in the field. A lot of the young people coming in take that for granted. And their condition, they're, they're more interested in the conditions of employment or what we are doing to help make them successful. I have at the Harvard Graduate School of Education legions of refugees, young people who've gone into teaching and come out of systems because they feel totally inadequately supported. Not just by management, but by their unions. They don't feel like they're in a satisfying profession that has possibilities, that's sustainable, that's gratifying, that fulfills their ideals when they made a decision to go into a field that isn't as remunerative as other fields. It just isn't there to keep them going. We haven't built an attractive, sustaining profession. And we need to do that. We need to figure out union and management together how we meet the needs of that young workforce. So those conditions have, have changed our environment. And I think, you know, with respect to building this narrative right now, I see a couple of different, I see kind of a fork in the road coming, or a fork in the road that's here. And it arises in the teacher union movement. It arises, I think, in the field in general. There are those who, in this moment, want to take up the cudgel and launch a campaign against virtually everything that's happened in the name of school reform over the past 20, 20 years, as misguided, as inappropriate, as we are now worse off than we were before. Let's pull that back and go back to the status quo ante, which incidentally wasn't so hot, particularly if you look at it from an equity standpoint. I think that's the wrong road to take, particularly for teacher unions right now. I think taking that avenue, and we see it emerging in certain places around the country right now, fulfills the worst stereotypes that the general public and that the general media and that certain policy elites have about what unions are all about. It's that blockage model that Pat talked about. You're sort of reifying that if you take on that posture, that our approach will be reactive. It's to take down the injustices that have been put up in the name of reform over the past 20 years. I don't, I'm not, I'm not making the case that there aren't legitimate grievances and excesses, but I'm just arguing strategically, I don't think that's the campaign for the unions, 
or for the field to take on right now. The alternative approach, in my view, connects back to this new engine I've been talking about and to this access between uh, professional and moral. For teachers to be the advocacy voice of students coming forward and saying, yes, we owe it to our students to live into this ideal of all means all. And we actually, as a field, know what it will take to get there. You, as policymakers, were naive in thinking that you could set a whole new set of goals for us and use the old architecture to get us there. We need new tools, new strategies, new opportunities and supports for our children if we're to get to the place that you've asked us to go, which incidentally is the right place to go. We agree with you on all means all, for moral reasons, for economic reasons. But we're the mechanics. We're the people who get the job done. And we need to share with you what it will take us to do the job that you've asked us to do. To me, that's a more constructive, positive, moral, lean into the future kind of campaign to run than a campaign that runs against what's been done in the past and demonize, demonizes those who've attempted to do it. So I'll leave you with that reflection. Um, I, I think we've got a great opportunity now. Opportunities only come up every so often in our field to make major changes. I think it's a huge opportunity for those of you in turn who have come together um, to, to bring voice from the field to the shape of policy to come. Um, and I welcome a conversation with you about it. Thank you for your time and attention.